talk as a group leader. Um, so I'm very excited to sort of introduce myself and, and present this to you today. Um, so thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the past work that I published in Linda Richards lab as a postdoc and how that's kind of transitioning into some current unpublished work and plans for the future as well. So to give you kind of a broad spectrum of, of this topic of how time shapes all brains with particular focus on the development and evolution of uh, the cerebral cortex. So this is the lab um, that we have now in the School of Biomedical Sciences. I share a lot of funding and students and projects with another group leader in the school, Rodrigo Suarez. Uh, and we co-supervise a lot of this team, a bioinformatician postdoc, uh, as well as a number of PhD students. Um, so please feel free to introduce yourselves to them if you ever see them around in the Australian community. So uh, in the focus of looking at the evolution and development of the corpus callosum, um, a, a typical tact that you might see in the field is looking at uh, comparing different species, for instance, mouse and humans. Um, and this can be incredibly beneficial in understanding what make this so special about the human brain, but it also has inherent confounds in that the human brain versus the mouse brain uh, is incredibly different in terms of size, in terms of gyroencephalization, um, which is the folding of the brain into cell sci and gyri, um, and, and other things that might uh, uh, be, be affecting the, the difference in the neocortex, uh, other than the actual phylogeny of splitting between species. So, uh, however, if you look at the group of mammals, um, only mammals have a neocortex. Birds have sort of homologous structures um, that are a, a bit difficult to actually compare in terms of function and transcriptional identity. But all mammals have a quite comparable neocortex, but they do have key differences between their neocortices uh, that can be interesting to con consider in terms of uh, the progressive development and evolution of the neocortex across mammalian history. So the mammal, mammalian groups that we have are eutheria, also known as placentals, which is humans and rodents, dogs, cats, etc. In Australia, we're very familiar with the marsupials, which is almost all of our native fauna, including kangaroos, koalas, anything that has a pouch, and including our particular model organism, which even people in Australia have never heard of, which is called the fat-tailed dunnart. And this is a small uh, mouse-sized marsupial that we have a captive breeding colony of. And then also there are the monotremes as, a, as another group of mammals, which includes the egg laying mammals, the platypus and echidna. So when we look at comparing the, the brains of the adult brain architecture of the marsupials and mice example species, those of you with some familiarity of coronal brain sections will see a lot of uh, homology, a lot of conservation of structures. The neocortex is vaguely up the top. The piriform cortex is down the side. The hippocampus is kind of in the middle. But there's a massive structure that's clearly absent from first sight of these sections, which is the corpus callosum. So in eutherians, the corpus callosum connects the two hemispheres and allows them to um, communicate, the two neocortical hemispheres. And this structure is just not there in all marsupial and monotreme species. So it's a novel, uh, the, it's a novelly emerged uh, in, only in eutherian mammals. So the neocortical connections of marsupials instead traverse uh, laterally down through the external capsule to cross instead through the anterior commissure of the brain, uh, which is more ventral commissure that eutherians also have um, to get to the other side. So we're particularly interested in comparing these two species because we see that they have a lot of utility going forward in understanding brain evolution from a phylogenetic point of view because they lack the confounds of having remarkably larger or smaller brains or more lysencephalic or gyroencephalic brains. Um, so both of them are kind of equivalently sized. They're both lysencephalic, um, unlike a lot of other species within both groups. So there are marsupials as well as monotremes that are gyroencephalized, just as some eutherians are. They also both have a six-layered neocortex that's remarkably similar in a lot of um, sort of key transcription factor uh, expression of different cell populations, as well as where those cell populations actually project to. So layer six contains corticothalamic uh, projecting neurons in both species, layer five contains corticospinal projecting, and layer two, three, and five contains intracortical projecting. However, those intracortically projecting uh, axon tracks go different routes. So in mouse, they go via the corpus callosum, and in marsupial, they go via the anterior commissure. <clears throat> 
So we've put in a lot of groundwork to uh, working up this as a, as a truly useful model organism. And one of the ways that we've done this is by developing this staging system from P0 in a marsupial, which all marsupials have an incredibly premature birth. They're born looking basically like an embryo um, and their brain development is at a point of very early embryos. So most of their brain development hasn't actually occurred yet. So we've um, done a very complex staging system of these compared to the mouse dealer system, where we can very precisely compare um, equivalent developmental stages where similar processes are happening. And one of the things that we based this staging system on is EDU injections, where we inject EDU, EDU at successive developmental stages to birth date uh, different layers of the cortex being born at those stages. And so we're we've tied this staging system very tightly to these results, such that when lower uh, at stage 20 in both species, both species, layer six neurons are predominantly being born. And at stage 23, upper layer neurons are predominantly being born, etc. So this will be important to keep in mind for the rest of the talk, because while um, there's no staging system that can exactly match between species, there will be some organ systems that will be behind or in front because of the inherent differences in in the sequence of developmental events, as well as within the brain, there'll be different processes that are happening at different times. But if nothing else, this staging system does match the birth of the neocortical layers between species. So another uh, procedure that we've worked up um, to be able to uh, investigate questions with uh, a lot of um, uh, freedom and scope within these two species is we've adapted a procedure that we were already expert in, in utero electroporation in mouse uh, mm -hmm. to in pouch electroporation in marsupials. And this is actually a much easier um, procedure to perform in marsupials because you can do it in the pouch and you don't need to perform a surgery on the mother, the recovery, etc., is much better. So just like in utero electroporation, we inject a plasmid into the lateral ventricle of the developing joeys, that's what they're called instead of pups, joeys, into their uh, brains. And then we pass an electric current across to integrate the plasmid into uh, the presumptive area of the brain that the electrodes are lying upon. So just like in utero electroporation, this stage at which we perform this procedure is crucially important to the identity of neurons that are being labeled. So it's only going to label neurons that are being born at that stage. And just like in our EDU birth dating experiments, we see that in a, just like in mouse, when we perform this procedure at stage 20, we label lower layer neurons in red. And then if we come back and do the same procedure at uh, a later stage, we label upper layer neurons. And we can do this, for instance, in a different color. So not only do we label the neuronal cell bodies, we also label their axon tracts and we can see uh, the progressive development of those axon tracts as they form growth cones and cross the brain. Uh, we can see where the, how they eventually organize, how they bundle, where their final targets are, et cetera. And you can see, for instance, that the schematic I showed you in the previous slide suggesting homology of the projection identities of these different cortical layers is actually the case experimentally, where if we label the deeper layer neurons, we see axon tracks only of the deeper layer neurons through the internal capsule pro projecting subcerebrally, whereas we see um, uh, axon tracks of both colors going across the anterior commissure to project intracortically from both of the, those cortical layers. So when we were first uh, starting up this electroporation procedure in both species, we started collecting at quite young ages to capture the first instances of projection out of um, uh, in the internal uh, intermediate zone um, and whether or not this showed directionality in terms of going medially towards the corpus callosum or laterally towards the anterior commissure. And we did see clear directionality from the offset in both species in different directions. So this kind of precluded the hypothesis that maybe uh, their, their axons would just branch in both directions and that they would only ramify and, and solidify in the direction where they could actually cross the midline. This wasn't the case. So really one of our first goals was to try to understand what is different about these brains that allows the medial versus lateral projection from the offset of these axon tracts. So one of the first ways that we set about doing this is by comparing a bulk uh, RNA-seq transcriptome of the developing cortex in both species at two developmental stages. Um, and we picked the stages when we already knew from our birth dating experiments that deeper and upper layer neurons were being born respectively. 
Uh, so we uh, performed a de novo transcriptome assembly in the case of the Dunna, uh, because the genome wasn't yet available. And we came up with a list of over 12,000 orthologous genes that we were able to compare between species in a ranked manner. So we ranked all of the genes from, from zero to over 12,000, and then we could compare that ranking between species, for instance, against known gene lists that are relevant for uh, questions about different uh, populations and identities of neurons in the developing cortex. So this is an example of one such gene list that we pulled from a paper published by Telly et al. in 2016, uh, who provided unique gene lists um, for progenitor type and neuronal type developing cortical neurons as they progress through developmental stages. And we found this interesting pattern at our two developmental stages that we picked early and late, where at the early stage, there was a skew in the ranking of genes um, that were uh, more or less ranked between species, such that the progenitor type cell genes were more enriched in mouse and less in Dunnart. And by contrast, uh, the neuronal type genes were more enriched in Dunnart and, and less in mouse. And this actually, uh, this trend actually inversed at the later developmental stage, and it was quite clear um, and, and um, significant as compared to just random, where you'd, you'd imagine a, um, a peak at the midline of this graph. So we confirmed this with immunohistochemistry to actually work out what was going on in the cortex itself, and we did see that um, using a number of markers known uh, canonically markers of these progenitor or neuronal type cells, we saw a larger proportion of the cortex dedicated to these different cell types. So this really painted a picture for us overall, um, uh, where even though the same populations of cells were being born at these two different ages, the context of the maturity of the cortex was quite different, where it was sort of more mature in the Dana at the early stage, and then less at the later stage, such that mouse was developing faster, even through those supposedly matched stages in terms of uh, birth dating. But this didn't really tell us uh, or give us a clear candidate for what might be controlling that lateral or medial fate. It just gave us kind of an overall view. So we did um, this again for another gene list that would be more specific to post-mitotic post cells. And we picked a gene list uh, published by Moyenu. Uh, for different, uh, uh, who fax sorted different projection neuron identities by using transcription factor combinations from the mouse cortex and came up with a list of genes that would uh, be uniquely uh, high in colossal projecting neurons as compared to the other projecting projection identities um, and sort of specify and, and be markers of that population. So perhaps naively, we sort of thought, oh, well, you know, marsupials don't have a corpus callosum. Maybe they're just not going to have as highly expressed, expre uh, highly ranked expression of any of these colossal type genes. And we'd see a clear trend just as we saw for the progenitor versus neuronal cells that I showed you in the last slide. And surprisingly, this wasn't the case. Despite them not having a corpus callosum, there was no clear trend uh, in them uh, as a group as lo more lowly or highly expressing these colossal type genes. Um, so, uh, and this was true for both developmental stages. So what we did instead was start to look at some of the extremes of this list of high and low expression. Um, and we picked out SATB2 as a candidate to begin our investigations, which as you can see, was expressed more highly in Dunnart or ranked more highly in Dunnart at this early stage. And then this ranking kind of normalized to the equivalent between species at the later stage. So this wasn't the only reason we were interested in SATB2, because there's been a wealth of literature about SATB2 as a colossal specifying transcription factor, um, such that it's expressed in colossal neurons. And it seems to do this by directly repressing CTIP2, another transcription factor that specifies uh, neurons to project to subcerebral targets. Uh, and it's expressed in those neurons and SATB2 isn't. So very excitingly, um, this has somewhat been demonstrated in SATB2 knockouts animals that have been published, uh, where when SATB2 is knocked out, they don't form a corpus callosum, and instead there's, there would be colossal axons project through the anterior commissure um, to, to reach the other side via that route. And of course, this is very similar to the endogenous phenotype that we see in our marsupials, where these axons cross via the anterior commissure, and they don't have a corpus callosum. 
So one very simplistic hypothesis may have been, well, maybe marsupials just lack the SATB2 protein and that's the end of that, that's the whole answer. It wasn't that simple, um, but I'll talk you through what we found. So uh, the first thing we wanted to know is whether or not marsupials even express SATB2 at a protein level, which hadn't been shown before. And if so, what cells it was actually expressed in. So to do this, we retrograde trace different population of cells. Um, so the subcerebrally projecting cells versus commissurally projecting, um, so intrahemispherically projecting. And then we co-stain for antibodies against SATB2 and CTIP2 in both species. And we saw a remarkable con conservation where CTIP2 was expressed in all of the um, the majority, vast majority of the subcerebral deeper layer projecting neurons, and SATB2 alone was expressed by the vast majority of the commissural upper layer neurons. So uh, this seemed to be um, uh, more conservation than we expected in terms of that, despite the interhemispheric inter uh, axons not going via the corpus callosum in marsupials, they still do seem to express SATB2 alone. So to um, understand a little bit more, we started to manipulate the function of SATB2 in both species. And we did this first by designing CRISPR constructs targeting two sequences in the SATB2 gene uh, that were similar to each other between both species of uh, uh, marsupial and mouse. And uh, we confirmed that this was indeed knocking down SATB2 at the protein level. And then in terms of the anatomy, we saw with both uh, SATB2 um, uh, guide RNAs, although I'm only showing you one, we saw an increase in axons traversing through the internal capsule when we knocked down SATB2 in both species, suggesting that its role as a repressor of subcerebral identity of axon fate was conserved between the two species. And then to see whether CTIP2 might also be involved in this, uh, we did a couple of things. We overexpressed CTIP2, we saw the same phenotype, I won't show you here, but we also overexpressed SATB2 and we took the two different species versions of the SATB2 genes um, and we overexpressed them in both species. And we saw in all cases that overexpression of either species SATB2 in either species resulted in a, um, a decrease of CTIP2 fluorescence intensity as measured by antibody. So it seems like this repressor of subcerebral fate may be via the repression of CTIP2 and that pathway seems to be conserved in both species. So then to um, better understand what SATB2 is actually doing in the brain, we looked at the anatomy that resulted from overexpressing SATB2. And we did this experiment at, uh, by electroporating SATB2 to overexpress it at this young age when deeper layer neurons are being born, um, because these deeper layer neurons go, go on to not really express uh, SATB2 uh, in entirety. Some of them only express CTIP2. And we made a very surprising uh, discovery that we really weren't expecting. So we found that when we did this in mouse, we found with both species version of SATB2, a massive increase in axons going through the anterior commissure compared to control. And this was um, very confusing and surprising because we already knew from the literature that when they knocked out SATB2 at a whole animal level, there were more axons through the anterior commissure. But here we were sort of doing the opposite experiment over overexpressing and we saw the same phenotype. So while we were puzzling over what this might mean, we did the same experiment in uh, marsupial, overexpressing it in marsupial, and we saw no difference in the fluorescence intensity of the anterior commissure um, by in, in marsupials as compared to mouse. So while we were trying to think about what this difference might mean, we went back to thinking about our RNA-seq results where SATB2 was more highly expressed in marsupial than mouse at the younger age. And we confirmed this, that it was also the case at the protein level by staining immunohistochemically with a SATB2 antibody in both species at progressive developmental stages. As, and as you can see, it's quite the case that at this early stage when deeper layer neurons are being born, there's a massive amount of SATB2 in the cortex of fat tailed donuts and not mouse. And this is really only normalized by stage 23 when upper layer neurons are being born. So then we looked at this graph and we looked at when we'd actually done the manipulations and we saw that we'd actually overexpressed SATB2 in a mouse at a stage when SATB2 is not normally expressed. And this resulted in more axons through the anterior commissure. And when SATB2 is expressed early endogenously in a marsupial, 
there's more axons through the anterior commissure because of course they don't form a corpus callosum. So we reasoned that perhaps not the different species specific uh, sequences of SATB2, nor perhaps the environment of uh, the axon that the axons are developing in, but maybe just the timing of expression of SATB2 is controlling the, the route uh, that these axons take. So to test this hypothesis, we overexpressed uh, SATB2 instead at this later developmental time point in the mice. And indeed, we didn't see any axons going through the anterior commissure. They all formed a corpus callosum. So that's the end of this um, work on the uh, SATB2 uh, heterochrony difference in timing and how just simple changes in the timing of an otherwise conserved transcription factor network uh, might crucially underlie some uh, complex phenotypes in evolution, such as the emergence of the corpus callosum. So I want to talk to you now just to end with a few uh, um, uh, ongoing projects and some um, uh, concepts that we're looking at more closely moving forward, again, to do with timing. And they focus around two contrasting questions. The first of which is, why is Fatteltana neocortical development so slow? So you might have noticed in this staging system that I put up that one developmental age, uh, one developmental stage in our staging system for mouse takes one day on average, and in Dunnart, it takes two or three days. So, so it takes um, Dunnarts, and this is true for marsupials in general, much longer to complete developmental events than it does for mouse. And it's not really clear exactly why this is. So some hypotheses that we've pulled out of the literature that we're really interested in getting um, uh, a, a little bit more detail on is first looking at whether marsupials might have a slower cell cycle length. Um, what parts of the cell cycle this might affect, what this might mean for development when one manipulates it. We also have noticed, and there's conflicting evidence for this in the literature, um, but we certainly see it's the case in our marsupials, is that they seem to have very few or even no abventricular mitosis. So they seem to lack a basal progenitor compartment. You can see that here with pH3 and macromitotic cells, that there's none above the ventricular zone at a couple of ages in our marsupial species. And finally, that there could be basal differences in that initial expansion of proliferating cells such that um, marsupials have a, um, a lower reservoir or a smaller reservoir with which to exponentially and quickly expand upon during cortical development. So we're interested in kind of investigating these to understand why their development is so slow, but also one of the things we're especially interested in is comparing it to its contradictory inverse question, which is why is fat tailed ne Dunnart neocortical development so fast? So what I mean by this is the slow comparison was looking at absolute time in terms of days. But if we come back to our staging system and remember these were equivalent in when the different layers of the neocortex were being born, if we compare electroporations of deeper and upper layer neurons at progressive time points subsequently, we see that compared to these stages, fat tail Dunnart development and marsupial development, we can infer, is actually really fast in terms of when mus, uh, mouse neurons are still in the early stages of migrating up into their final layers. Marsupial neurons have already finished th their migration journey and are projecting axons that have already crossed the midline. So they're much more advanced in terms of the maturation of the uh, the, matur the maturity context in which these neurons are being born. So uh, we're interested in kind of quantifying which of these different developmental processes such as migration and axon extension uh, are contributing to this fast first slow, whether or not all of them are sped up and slowed down equivalently, or if there's some that are more amenable and temporally plastic during development and evolution to have big changes and others might be more fixed and, and um, dependent on absolute timeframes. So we're doing this by performing electroporations and quantifying um, in, in quite a lot of detail, the different stages of migration and axon projection that are happening um, at, in terms of absolute days, following the electroporation within the species. So we'll come up with uh, a number um, for the different events that we'll be able to compare across the board to look at how much they compare to those different timescales. So uh, I'll leave you with uh, this analogy for kind of what we're interested in doing in looking at the time scale of development as a whole between species, which is to think about um, development as beads on an elastic string and the Dunnart protracted development and marsupial protracted development as a stretched out series of these beads on a string. 
And it's not known currently, and we're, we're interested in looking at whether these beads are also elastic and can stretch with the string, whether they're not elastic and they can um, be spaced evenly along the string or whether they clump, um, each bead being, for instance, uh, early stages of migration, late stages of migration, differentiation, et cetera. And, or there could also be a mixture of all of these different um, categories uh, during development and evolution. So we think that this will be important, not just for those kinds of questions of interspecies evolution, but also you can imagine that with the complexity of developmental sequences that happen in the neocortex, uh, that there's good evidence that differences in timing can underlie neocortical disorders such as um, autism and schizophrenia. And we're interested in also how these sorts of things could contribute to human pathologies. So we're doing this in a number of ways. Um, we're developing a, a large data set of developmental um, time points of single cell RNA-seq between our species. And this is not just a representative image. We, this is the first um, uh, data that we pulled off the sequencer this week. We're still working out what the cell populations actually are, um, but this, this should be ready early next year, we hope. Um, and we're really excited for what that will tell us in a lot of depth about differences between these species. We're also doing a number of experiments where we manipulate via electroporation um, uh, the timing of different, of different sub-processes in development, such as changing the length of cell cycle, um, as well as cleavage angle, et cetera. We're initiating some interspecies transplant experiments to look at when you put a mouse neuron in a Dunnart context or a Dunnart neuron in a mouse context, how that changes the timing of that neuron's development or not, as well as the um, whether or not it changes the direction that the axons take when they try to get across the midline. And finally, we're interested in looking at kind of development and evolution from a more more systemic perspective, and especially in understanding how this incredibly premature birth of marsupials might be affecting their brain development. Because of course, premature birth, you would, you would suppose would affect a lot of systemic factors like oxygenation, um, metabolism, thyroid signaling, thermoregulation, et cetera. And it's already known that those kinds of factors can really affect brain development. So we're interested in thinking not just how about single nucleotide polymorphisms and single genes can affect brain development and evolution, but also how just the fact of being born so early might inherently contribute to some of those differences in adult brain architecture that we see. So uh, with that, um, thank you for your attention. Uh, my email's here if you'd like to have a further chat about anything or discuss um, potential collaboration ideas um, or just have a chat, then please don't hesitate to email me. I'd like to acknowledge again the current lab as well as um, some previous lab members and collaborators. Annalisa Paulino was a very talented PhD student that um, contributed to a lot of the SAPI2 story. And um, a lot of this work also came from uh, postdoc in um, was initiated in my postdoc in Linda Richards lab. So with that, thanks for your attention and the funding and um, various facilities. Thank you, Laura. That was fantastic. We've got time for a couple of questions. So I'll read a few off the chat. One from Julian. Is there any evidence? Oh, I've lost my chat. <laughs> right. I'm on top of things this morning. Where is it? Is there any evidence as to whether post-translational regulation of SATB2 protein, such as phosphorylation, is different between the mouse and the Dunnart, such that each might influence cellular levels in different ways to affect the timing of its presence for transcriptional programming? Yeah, so that's a that's a really interest, interesting idea. We don't have any evidence for or against it at the moment. Um, uh, we, there, there's some uh, work, really nice work done in mice that there's a lot of upper layer markers um, that have transcript, uh, translational suppression um, and uh, that the transcripts are present during early development, but they're translationally repressed um, until later in development. And there could be, um, it could be that some of those are released in the marsupial. There's some nice work about uh, microRNAs that can uh, repress directly repress SAP2, and that's one of our hypotheses for what's regulating this timing difference. Um, but yeah, that's that's all to come. We don't have any direct evidence yet. Okay, there's another question from Matt Kirkaldi. Uh, wondering if the cortical time course could be an epiphenomenon of maturational properties which are needed to support the migration process into the pouch, such as hooking up the rubrospinal or locomotor complexes. Good question. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's um, a super interesting idea. Um, that that um, yeah is exactly right. That the the marsupials need to uh, during kind of a uh, 
pre almost pre brain development stage they actually need to move to get up into the pouch um, and 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 attach the teat um, so yeah there, there could be a number of things related to that early birth any number of things including the the necessity to actually use parts of the brain that could be influencing this time course and subsequent brain development yeah we're, we're super interested in that idea and one quick last question from Dimitri down in Melbourne. How easy is it to make transgenic donuts? Can it be done? So um, that's that's uh, historically been really difficult because they have a really tough corian ar around the, um, the uh, egg. Uh, but there was the first opossum, which is an um, American marsupial, that they made a transgenic opossum that was released in nature earlier this year. So apparently it's possible, um, but we really like the utility of our in-pouch electroporation method because it's so quick and cheap. We can test a whole bunch of gene things. It also has benefits in terms of cell populations and cell autonomy. Um, so so um, we're not planning on any transgenics just yet, um, but yeah, it's definitely with, with, the te with the opossum paper, it definitely could be possible in the future. Thank you 